Hello, I'm Daryl. I am a air quality scientist with Broward County, and I'll be reading to you today. The book we're going to be reading is Mario and the Hole in the Sky, How a Chemist Saved Our Planet by Elizabeth Rush, and it was illustrated by Teresa Martinez. Mario Molina was born in Mexico City on March 19, 1943. By the time he was six, the world was awash in amazing new products made from amazing new chemicals. Spray, spray. Mario's mother misted perfume onto her wrists. Squirt, squirt. Someone polished a window. Spurt, spurt. A press of a button propelled cleaner onto a counter, paint onto a fence, and hairspray onto curls. But one of the new chemicals used in millions of spray cans and refrigerators had a dangerous side that no one had yet discovered. Feliz cumpleaños, Mario. On Mario's eighth birthday, his parents gave him a microscope. Mario peered through the lens at a drop of water. <laughs> Boring, he thought. Then he began to wonder, what would happen if I looked at dirty water? Mario soaked some lettuce and let it rot. After a few days, the gooey brownish green mess smelled awful. Mario plugged his nose, sucked up a dropper of the filthy water and dripped it onto a slide. He peered into the lens and gasped. Incredibly, all these amazing creatures in just one drop of water. Mario studied everything he could under the microscope sparkling sea salt crystals, tomatoes, onions, chilies from salsa, even toothpaste. Mario was itching to see more. Can I use this bathroom as a laboratory? He asked his parents. No one ever uses it. Dios mio, his mother groaned. Sounds messy. But they removed the toilet for him and installed some shelves. <laughs> Don't blow anything up, his father warned. Clink, clink, hiss, whoosh. Bitter smelling smoke wafted out from under the door of Mario's bathroom lab. What are you up to, Mario? asked his Aunt Esther, who was a chemist. Look at this, Tia. He showed her what scorched detergent looked like on a slide. She smiled and said, I think you need a few more things. She brought him a Bunsen burner and chemicals not found in a kid's chemistry set. Mario carefully mixed portions in his bathroom lab. Miraculously, substances changed from black to yellow, from water-soluble to waterproof. He conducted more experiments with a chemistry teacher in boarding school in Switzerland. He burned chemicals over the flames of Bunsen burners. Sparks flashed purple, pink, crimson, red, and green, blue like fireworks. To Mario, chemistry had a mysterious power a power that was changing the world around him. Stores were full of new and improved products featuring remarkable new ingredients that promised to be cheaper, better, and easier. But Mario knew that even chemicals that seemed harmless could react with things in the environment and become dangerous. As Mario continued his study of chemistry, a question nagged him. Were these new chemicals really safe? Soon after getting his PhD and beginning work in the United States, Mario heard something that started him on a quest to find out. A scientist studying air samples found tiny amounts of chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, floating around in the air. Mario knew CFCs were used in refrigerators, air conditioners, insulation, and fast food containers, and as propellant in millions of spray cans. He and his colleague, F. Sherwood Rowland, wondered, once CFCs were sprayed into the air or leaked out at a dump, what would happen to them? Mario and Sherry set up a bunch of experiments to find out. They mixed CFCs with water. Most chemical compounds dissolve in rain, but CFCs did not dissolve. They shone lights on the CFCs. Some chemical compounds break down when light shines on them, but the CFCs didn't break down. They set up a contraption to mimic Earth's lower atmosphere where any surviving chemical compounds usually decompose, but still the CFCs endured. In the upper atmosphere, a layer of ozone surrounds our planet. 
Like a powerful sunscreen, the ozone layer filters out deadly solar radiation, known as ultraviolet light. What would happen if CFCs reached the ozone layer, Mario asked. To answer the question, Mario grabbed the simplest of tools of a chemist, a pencil and paper. He jotted down the ingredients that could be released if radiation broke down CFCs. Carbon, called C, fluorine, called F, chlorine, called Cl. Then he wrote down what would happen if those ingredients reacted with the oxygen, called O3 in ozone. Mario discovered something scary. Chlorine floating around, freed by radiation, would break up the ozone. Bent over his chemical equations, Mario felt a huge weight pressing on him. The problem was even worse. After the chlorine destroyed ozone, the chlorine survived. It would float around and destroy more and more ozone. Just one atom of chlorine could knock out tens of thousands of molecules of ozone. Without ozone, deadly solar radiation would bombard Earth, killing all plant and animal life. Mario hurried to Sherry's office. We have a problem, a serious problem, and we have to do something. Mario and Sherry faced a sea of TV and newspaper reporters. CFCs used in millions of products are destroying our ozone layer, they said. They tried to explain the chemistry behind it, but only a few news reports followed and none captured the magnitude of the crisis. Mario tried again. He told Congress that CFCs were destroying the ozone layer. Still, no one took action. No one seemed to understand how serious the problem was. Mario was aghast. People believed it was just impossible that humankind could endanger the entire planet. The planet was big enough. It would just take care of itself, he says. But I knew this wasn't true. For more than 10 years, Mario continued to study the problem and warn people about the danger. If we keep using CFCs, he said, huge chunks of ozone layer will thin or disappear. Skin cancer and eye disease could surge. Crops could fail. It could be a catastrophe. Chemical companies, newspapers, even other scientists said horrible things about Mario. Some even accused him of being a spy, trying to cause chaos in America. But why in the world would I make this up, Mario thought. I'm a scientist. He never gave up. Then a British scientist took some measurements of ozone in the atmosphere. He found something strange. There seemed to be a huge hole in the ozone over the Antarctic, a hole the size of the United States. People wondered how that could happen. How could we have so much impact on our atmosphere and so quickly? Mario and Sherry again tried to explain the chemistry. Still, people demanded more proof. Scientists launched an expedition to Antarctica, counting chlorine and ozone from a high-flying airplane. The results were clear and horrifying. Chlorine was definitely destroying ozone. Finally, people believed the scientists. Something had to be done, but what? Leaders from countries all over the world flocked to Montreal, Canada to discuss the problem. Mario explained the science. He pleaded for nations to join together to stop the destruction of ozone layer. The discussions were so slow and cumbersome, he says, I worried that they might not succeed. Representatives returned to their countries across the globe. Mario returned to his home in the United States and waited. This was the Earth's first global issue, says Mario. There really was no example of the whole planet taking action on something like this before. I didn't know what would happen. Then Mario heard the news. 28 countries, including the United States and Mexico, agreed to stop making CFCs. Soon, 46 countries agreed. Then more than 190 countries, nearly every country in the world, agreed to the Montreal Protocol. It was thrilling and satisfying and very much a relief, Mario says. For a while, CFCs already floating around in the air continue to rise to the ozone layer, but Earth slowly makes ozone all the time. Once the barrage of CFCs lessened, the ozone layer began to recover. It is expected to heal completely by 2070. 
humans had created the first global environmental problem and they found a way to fix it. Now, when Mario visits his hometown of Mexico City, where pollution clouds his view of a snow-capped volcano, he worries about another invisible problem, global warming. The burning of oil, coal, and gas is changing the world's climate at a terrifying pace. But Mario has hope for our planet. His work on the ozone layer has shown that nations, together, can solve global problems. We can work with all the countries, all cultures, all peoples of the world, he says. We can work together. It is possible. We saved our planet once. We can do it again. Global warming is not the first instance of humans endangering the planet. The threat to the ozone layer was eerily similar. We may be in the thick of the global warming problem now, but our experience with the ozone hole suggests that a solution is within our reach. Pause here to read the surprising similarities between the ozone hole and global warming. Pause here to read through the timeline. Thank you for taking the time to read with me today. And to all my future young scientists, I hope that this motivates you to take a career into science and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys along the way.